Thank you very much. So I, when I received this invitation, I, I said yesterday, I was sitting at and thinking, what do I write? You know, what, do you, what kind of speech do you present to a group of very young, brilliant people who obviously are very deeply invested in the ideational space and who understand a lot of the issues that I want to touch on, to tackle on? And I, I sat there and I was reading, you know, trying to reference um, Paul of Freer and, and am I going to touch on something from Pedagogy of the Oppressed? Am I going to Fanon? What am I going to look at? And I thought, you know, um, one can write a very impressive and very eloquent speech um, dealing very deeply with theory and all of that. But uh, that's something that students have been doing for the last six or six months or a year. And um, I thought that perhaps what would be important perhaps is to give this theory a little bit of a human experience, right? To share a story rather than necessarily to, you know, share an intellectual conversation that delves deeply into theory, which is very important, by the way. We are not in an anti-intellectual space, but I do think that uh, it's also very important that we locate our human experiences in these theories in order that they make sense, right? And so I decided that I'm going to tell you a story which I have jotted down, and pardon me that I'm going to read. Unfortunately, I have not had sufficient time to prepare in terms of being able to speak from the cuff and all of that. Um, so I'm going to read this to you, and I hope that it will be as engaging as it would be had it been a PowerPoint presentation or something, <laughs> uh, which I'm not very fond of, by the way. In 2013, is it loud? Oh, do I need to speak louder? Oh, no, no, I can do that. I've got capacity to do that. I've got capacity to do that. No, I'll do that. So in 2013, at the age of 21, I mobilized about 10,000 rands and used it to travel across the Sadek region. I woke up one morning and I decided that I needed to see this beautiful continent that I call home. I knew that using public transportation, specifically buses and taxis, would save me a lot of money. But I also knew that this money was inadequate to cover my accommodation costs. And so I did something brave, or perhaps stupid. I posted on Facebook that I wanted to tour the region and on my own and needed people to accommodate me in all the countries that I had on my schedule. Not long after this, I received numerous messages from men and women I had never met before, had never spoken to, offer offering me their homes. The innocence of youth guided me to accept this offer. And so one evening, I packed my bags and the following morning, I made my way to the taxi rank just outside Johannesburg Park Station, where I boarded a taxi to Manzini in Swaziland, or Eswatin. After a few days in the enlightening presence of comrades in Swaziland, student activists who were staying in a rented house, but who welcomed me without hesitation, I took a taxi to Maputo. After a few days in each country, I would take a taxi and continue onwards with my journey from Maputo to Arare, Arare to Lusaka, and all the way to Luanda in Angola. Almost 10, ten countries later, I returned home. Throughout my journey, I stayed with families who did not know me in countries I had never been before, amongst people whose ways I was not necessarily familiar with. They refused to let me contribute anything towards groceries or electricity, insisting that I was one of their own. It was the most enlightening two months of my life, and it changed me immeasurably. Not least of all because it was during this time that I met a young man in Zimbabwe, Chirati Zunyamulsika, who by all indications is the love of my life. <laughs> uh, seated right there. <laughs> Three weeks ago, I hosted a group of young Zimbabwean friends and comrades, men and women who are passionate about justice and who have dedicated their, lung, their young lives to its pursuit. Upon concluding our dinner, I requested that I take them to see my family in Soweto. They declined my offer, and when I asked why, my friend Tinashe Chisaira, who had hosted me many times in Zimbabwe before, <coughs> responded, because in Soweto, they kill foreigners. I tried to explain that they won't harm them in my neighborhood, to which another friend, Alan Moyo, responded, they might not harm us in your neighborhood, but since we must pass through the Johannesburg CBD when we get there, we are still unsafe because they might kill us there. In the Johannesburg CBD, they kill foreigners. That statement pierced my heart and left me thinking very deeply about what it means when, a young, when young African people cannot walk freely in this country that I call my home. I find myself wondering if this South Africa that I love so immensely and to which I owe so much of who I am is a country 
that I can comfortably raise my unborn children, who one day, who one day might be asked to prove the authenticity of their Africanness in the Johannesburg CBD or West Steel in Soweto, where I was born and raised. I thought about this for many days after my comrades and friends had returned to Zimbabwe. I thought about this. I thought about this, and as I read one newspaper article after another, listened to one radio interview and television discussion after another, in which so many of our people confidently and comfortably argued that these foreigners must leave South Africa. Some voices were raw in their delivery of the message. These Makwarekwares, who are taking our jobs, selling drugs to our women, selling young drugs to our children, and sending our women into prostitution, must go. Other messages were less vulgar. They were claiming that foreigners pose a huge strain on our social infrastructure, that there are just too many and our porous borders must be tightened and so on. However sophisticated the language of the latter group, the message was the same. There are foreigners in this country and they must leave. I wondered very often who exactly these foreigners are who must leave, because imagery seemed to suggest to me that the foreigners are men and women of color. It suggested that the foreigners who must, leave the Af who must leave are Africans who are running from ecological disasters such as droughts brought on by climate change, a condition that exists precisely because greedy Western corporations have decided that the neoliberalization of nature, its destruction, is a small price to pay for exorbitant profits. It suggested that the foreigners who must leave are Africans who are running from political and economic instabilities in countries that are still battling to recover from centuries of systematic dispossessions by Western powers that decided at the Berlin Conference that our continent is a cake and everyone deserves a slice. These Africans who are foreigners and who must leave South Africa are men and women who came here to help develop this country whose very economy rests on the backs of migrants and always has. In all these conversations that I've had, not once has the image of this foreigner been a European who came into this country lured by its mineral wealth. The image of the foreigner who must leave is not the multinational companies that are at the heart of illicit capital outflow in this continent. And this is why the foreigner who shivers at the thought of going to the Johannesburg CBD is not the European or the American. This foreigner, even at the heart of the violence, was still able to patronize the morning precinct a gentrified space from whence the privileged gaze at the plight of the poor around them. This foreigner whose whiteness shielded him from the angry mobs that went door to door in search for the African foreigner who must go, could still sip virgin mojitos while enjoying a plate of malamukhod at Vilagazi Street in the heart of Soweto, where law-abiding Zimbabwean young people would dare not go. But something else preoccupied my mind, a question that I want to pose to the graduates of the Tabombeki African Leadership Institute on this occasion of their certification. What is it that we are doing? Those of us who claim to believe in the importance of unity, in the vision of the African Renaissance, to rewrite this narrative that seeks to suggest that our own brothers and sisters are foreigners and that this country is not their home. What is it that we are doing as a group of young people who have internalized the works of President Tabombeki, of Franz Fanon, of, of Professor Ali Mazrui, of Dr. Baba Lamakotwan, of Dr. Sipogazi Makala, works that speak to the ways in which colonialism is de-civilizing and dehumanizing, to contest the signifying process that defines the language of anti-Africanness in our country. A brilliant professor of public affairs at the Tswani University of Technology, Professor Mashupia Masurumule, who is with us here in the audience this evening, contends that the university is a, social is a social institution that gives us an opportunity to recreate society. He contends that it is in this space that we can recreate the society that we have inherited by first and foremost reimagining ourselves into existence. The poignancy of this contention lies in the recognition that centuries of colonialism which have birthed South African exceptionalism, have created of us a people who are far from themselves, a people who are here as physical entities, but devoid of the substance that makes us human, that defines our very existence. 
Franz Fanon argues that colonialism works on the past of the oppressed people and distorts, disfigures, and destroys it, such that what remains is a shell of nothingness. The Tabombeki African Leadership Institute has done its part in equipping you as young people here with the necessary theory to reconstruct this nothingness, to fill this empty void that sits where a sense of true humanity ought to be. What you do with it is what will determine whether this institution, this country that we all love so much, will become a home for all Africans. It will determine whether the narrative that will define this generation of ours is that we sat and did nothing when our brothers and sisters were called foreigners and told that they do not belong in this country. Or whether we will be defined by what Ngugiwa Thiongo so thoroughly characterized as the search for a liberating perspective within which we see ourselves clearly in relationship to ourselves and to the universe. And ultimately, what you do with the certificate will decide whether we can, once and for all, as South African people who for so long have denied ourselves an opportunity to see our own people as what they truly are, human, an opportunity to fashion a higher civilization. Because after all, as Steve Biko says, this generation and those before us and those that come after us, the children we have not birthed, has got one responsibility and one responsibility only. To bestow upon the people of South Africa the greatest gift possible, a more human face. Thank you.